Hello, everyone. I, I think, yeah, we're on air. Um, welcome to to this talk. I'm just going to set up uh, set up PowerPoint. So uh, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, performance and uh, when we really need to optimize performance and how best to do it uh, in Clojure. So uh, I'm going to go quickly kind of go over some of the basics of how you want to get into it but i also want you all to to keep in mind like why it is that we're optimizing performance um and when we even need to do that and i'm going to talk a lot about those uh today anyways uh quick uh, quick background uh, about me uh so i'm a full stack developer i work at a market research firm called synchronous in toronto canada um and we we, so market research is mostly like doing online service, uh, online surveys and focus groups. So a lot of the work that I end up doing has to do with automating uh, data analysis from the sources that we have there. And uh, and oops, one sec. So uh, I'm uh, I work a lot with Clojure. It's the primary uh, language that we use at work, and that's kind of where the 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 need to optimize performance came into play. So um, if, if you don't mind switching to the PowerPoint. Yep. So let's go through some of the, the basics of performance and closure. So when and why do we need to optimize performance? Um, in many cases, you won't really need to think about the, the scenarios and the things that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, in most cases, it's like a secondary need that arises after you build an application, so after the primary function is there. So optimization, optimization usually comes up when your users uh, tell you that, hey, things are slow, or you yourself realize that, hey, this is taking like way too long. And at the end of the day, you need to have a faster experience uh, to meet some kind of business need. Um, so that's that's when it's most that's when the need to optimize comes into play. Why you should optimize it is to offer your end users a better experience. Uh, so the first step when it comes to optimization is not to use any of the things I'm going to talk about today, but to just go through go through your uh, code and realize whether or not you have maybe redundant uh, calls going on or cleaning up your code to make it run more effectively. Oftentimes, a lot of the a lot of the slowness that comes uh, in a program is simply a result of Poorly, uh, poorly written code, which at the time served its purpose, but wasn't performance driven, so to speak. And um, and that doesn't really involve any of the things I've talked about. It's just like making sure that, oh, hey, I'm not calling this function a uh, hundred times uh, over and over again, even though I only need to really call it once. Um, so, so for most cases, honestly, that alone is gonna be enough. But I wanna talk about some of the interesting stuff in Clojure, and that's what we're gonna be doing today. Um, so before I get uh, any further, one of the main things you need to do is benchmark again and again and again. Uh, before you you change any code, before you optimize anything, you need to run some benchmarks. You need to see how long a certain function is taking, how long different elements of that function are taking. And when you make a change, you then need to benchmark those. And when you're doing all this, try and keep in mind uh, different scenarios uh, that might pop up. Am I going to be passing a very small collection to the function every now and then? How does that impact performance? Am I going to be passing a large collection? Uh, does that impact performance uh, in, a, in a different way? So all these things need to be measured and uh, paid attention to when you're trying to optimize. So um, aside from like the simple just run, run time function a bunch of times, uh, a library that I strongly recommend you look at is Criterium. I won't get too much uh, into the details in this talk as to why you should use Criterium over just running time a lot, um, but uh, go check out the GitHub page if you're interested and uh, want, want to seriously look at optimizing your performance. So without further ado, I'm going to go right into some of the techniques that we're going to talk about, some of the, some of the features of Clojure uh, and other languages even. Uh, the first one is memoization. So when I first heard of memoization and try, started to learn about it, uh, the, the way I, I thought about it was it's just like memorization, but you take away the R. Um, and maybe that'll help some of you here today. So what is memoization? 
um, memoize enclosure, it just wraps a function and gives it a, a very simple cache. Um, so whenever you pass any parameters, uh, any parameters to that function that are the same as ones you've done before, it won't reevaluate things. It'll just return the output. So you can kind of think of it as if memoize helps uh, helps you remember the output to a given input. Um, uh, thanks for including the link to Criterion, by the way, in the chat. I'm trying to keep an eye on what's going on here. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask, and I'll get to those. Um, so the parameters that are passed through to any function that's memoized are treated as the keys to a map in an atom. And then when the, when the function is called again, uh, with the same with with any parameters actually, it tries to look up that key in the atom. If that if that key exists, then it just returns the value, and there's no need for reevaluation to be done. But if it doesn't exist, then it evaluates it, stores the result in the atom, and then. Yeah, and, and then next time, next time that same uh, function is called, you get uh, you get the output. Uh, you just get the output received, and no recalculation is done. So when do you want to use memoization? Uh, you should be using it if you're going to be repeatedly sending the same parameters uh, as inputs, and if you're going to be sending it to a function that takes a long time to compute, or it at least costs a lot of computational power. So. You should also use memoization if the function calls are what's called uh, referentially transparent. So that means if the output alone is sufficient, so if there are no side effects, if there is nothing happening that you want done uh, through this function other than just getting the output. You shouldn't be using it if you expect the output to change over time. So if you think that um, maybe, it, it, even, even with the same parameters they pass through, if you expect that your end result is going to be different, you should not be using memoization because that would just mess it up. Um, and if there are any side effects, so if it's not referentially transparent, you probably don't want to do it. And if you want the side effects actually ran, or lastly, if your outputs or inputs are sufficiently large enough that it would cost a large chunk of memory to actually store it in place. So uh, one of the trade-offs, and I'm going to talk a bit about it, about some of this stuff as we go through. One of the trade-offs with memoization is that you, you are sacrificing uh, memory for performance. And if you have very sizable outputs and inputs, that's going to take a good, chunk of, uh, a good chunk of your memory. I mean, it might not be that important to you, but in some cases, it's, uh, it's notable. So uh, let's get right into uh, a problem that uh, that we looked at. So a bit of quick bit of background on some of the problems I'm going to talk about today. A lot of these were found when we were trying to optimize the performance of one of our calculation libraries. Um, it was running a bit slowly, and we were just looking at a bunch of different things. Uh, how we found this one specifically is that we know that there's uh, we realized that there's like a lot of um, Oh, how to put it, there's retrieval from a, a database to get the data, and then formatting that's done on top of it. Whenever we make a call, we know that the output should always be the same as long as the, it, as long as the parameters, the ID that we pass through is the same. So oftentimes, when one project is being analyzed, the same map of data needs to get formatted repeatedly over and over again. And that's why this scenario seemed kind of like the perfect opportunity to use it. So. Um, this is the code that we're looking at before. I'll quickly walk you through it. I'm not sure. I guess you can't see my mouse. Oh, wait. No, you can. Cool. Um, so quick, you, quickly walk you through it. Um, the function that we're going to be looking at here is called formatted data map. And what formatted data map does is it first gets the data map from, from the database and then formats it through this function that we have here. And this function does like a couple of different things. Essentially, it puts it into a map and it merges it and whatnot. I mean, it's not the most efficient function that we're looking at, and we actually can clean this up a bit later anyways. But for, for the sake of what we're looking at here, uh, when, we, when I ran the Criterion benchmark, uh, it executed in about 12.7 milliseconds uh, on average. And what we did here was we took, we took the formatted uh, formatted data map and just wrap memoize around it. So let's take a look at that. So we just we, we took formatted data map, wrap memoize about, about it, and then we just get the output here. Now keep in mind that when uh, when it's called the first time, it's going to take 12.7 milliseconds to do. 
But since Criterion, Criterion uh, benchmarks it over and over again, it runs, uh, I forget how many different trials, uh, the mean, mean computation time is going to be significantly lower in the long run. And for us, this was important because we're constantly calling formatted data map with the same parameters. So we went from 12.7 milliseconds to less than 100 nanoseconds, which is a massive difference. I mean, it, it varies very much uh, based off of like what you actually have. But for us, it was a big deal, especially when we were doing repeated calculations over and over again. Um, one, one thing to note before I move on is that memoize returns a function. That's why we're using a def here instead of a, a, a def function. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. So um, if you find yourself using memoize a lot, you'll notice that there are a couple of features that you would probably like to have, such as being able to clear the cache. Let's say like your data suddenly changes in that 1% of times that, uh, that you want the output to be different. You might want to clear the cache in that case. You might want to limit the size of the cache if you're concerned that uh, memory uh, might be a problem. So uh, you might want to speed up access for like commonly used results or just recently accessed ones. And for all of that, uh, there's a great library out there that I use called uh, Core Memoize. I, I have the link here. And hopefully, one of you great fellows will post it out in the chat. Um, Oh, wait, one of you already did. Thanks, guys. Uh, so yeah, this this library would just helps manage all of that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's a great library. I, I really recommend you actually take a look at the code and get an idea of how it works as well. OK, let's move on into paral parallelization. Uh, first, we're going to be talking about PMAP. Uh, and I really want to talk about this stuff uh, kind of heavily. This is going to be the second end and, and third parts, actually, parallelization, because that's something that, that we all say closure is supposed to be good for. So let's talk about why it is. Um, so parallelization is, uh, is basically running multiple things at the same time across multiple threads. Um, and what PMAP is, is just a parallelized map. It runs map across multiple threads. So it kind of splits splits up your large collection into a bunch of smaller collections and runs them across multiple threads and then joins them at the end. One important thing to note is that PMAP is lazy. So just calling PMAP won't cause any kind of calculation to begin. Um, what it tries to do is it wraps each element of the collection that you're mapping through as a future. And then it later attempts to deref and synchronize them based off of like the number of threads that you have available on your CPU. Um, it's, it's a bit confusing if you look at the actual code for PMAP. So uh, a simple way I put to, that you could try to imagine it is to look at uh, as, as just a, a map and you map future uh, function, uh, the collection. And that might give you an idea of what's kind of happening behind the scenes. I mean, it's, it's a bit trickier because it, it has to do stuff with like coordinating it and merging it in the correct order. But that's more or less what's going on. So when do you want to use PMAP? Um, oh, sorry. Let me let me take a quick look to answer this question. Um, Memoize is a part of Clojure. Uh, Core Memoize is an additional library. Uh, yes, Brent. Uh, so core memoize is a separate library. It's not part of Clojure core. Uh, but uh, if you're if you're doing any kind of memoization that you're concerned about, like uh, concerned about performance or, or sorry, not performance, um, concerned about using up too much memory or that you might need to change uh, or invalidate the cache, that's when you want to look at core memoize. Um, also, try and answer these other two questions before moving on. Uh, has anyone made a version of PMAP for operations where you don't need the output in the original order? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not aware of that, but that would, uh, I'll talk a bit about this later, but that would actually improve the performance of, of something like PMAP where you don't care about the order. Um, so that'd be, that would be really, uh, really useful. Um, and last question, does core memoize play well with transducers? Uh, I haven't used transducers with core memoize. Um, I'm not actually sure the answer to that question. Sorry about that. OK, we're going to move on. Uh, when should I use PMAP? Uh, OK, so if, if you're mapping through a function that takes a lot of computational power, a lot of like 
a lot of your processor, that's when you want to to use it and just like and parallelize parallelize it so you're not just running one part at a time. However, if you, if you shouldn't be using it if you're going to lose any time that you would gain from actually coordinating the items in the collection. As that question just uh, just asked, like if the, is there a PMAP out there that doesn't care about the order? A lot of the a lot of the time is actually being lost from uh, trying to coordinate uh, the little the, the the partition parts of the collection and putting it back together in the correct order once it's evaluated. You also probably don't want to use this or any parallelization if you don't want to max out your CPU. I mean, there's some ways to to manage it, but I'm not going to focus on that. Um, and I just want to point out that there's a lot of different ways to use parallel processing in Clojure. Uh, I'll talk about one more later in this uh, talk today. But if performance is important and it's something that you care about, you really should uh, read more about it. Like some things you can look at are futures, delays, promises, uh, and a lot of our other things that Clojure has out there. OK, so let's, let's go through a quick problem. Um, so what, what we, um, hmm. Let me, let me give a quick background, I guess. So the data that we're going to be looking at is going to be a collection of maps uh, as part of the raw, raw data. So it could be a, a, a several thousands of items might be in the collection. And we're going to be running a computationally intensive function called a uh, calc function uh, and using that to generate a new map, or using the outputs to generate a new map. Um, so we're going to be using the outputs of calc function to create a map that we're going to re want to return. And we also want to map this process multiple times. We want to do it once for every. Uh, <laughs> you want to do it once for every variable that you want to calculate. Um, and for like the example I'm going to be looking at is actually a bit complex, so we try to simplify it a bit. Uh, the function may seem a bit confusing, so if you have any questions about that, just try uh, just shout it out in the chat, and I can try and explain it. Um, so this is the function. Uh, it's called uh, row calc. Uh, it takes in uh, it takes in a data parameter. That's the data we talked about, which is a collection of maps. A, a weight variable. Uh, no need to worry about that for now. It's just taken in by the calc function. I can simplify that. And the variables that we want to map through, and also um, the calc function, and uh, potentially some conditions that are also uh, mapped through. So, uh, so essentially, what it does is it maps it. It maps all the var vars, so this could be like five to ten different vars, maybe even more. I think at most we've done it with thirty or forty different uh, vars. So it maps through each of those, and then it maps through the calc function and applies the uh, applies formatting onto the output of the calc function. The calc function returns uh, a, a collection of two items, one that has the value and the size, and those are both used uh, used to create the new map here. Um, so I mean. The, the timing that happens here kind of depends on the complexity of the arguments that are being passed through, the conditions, uh, the, the number of bars. I tried to choose like a very like a very simple example to, to show the minimum effect that I could get with PMAP here. Um, and and I'll, I'll point out a caveat uh, after. I think I already talked about it before. But um, in some cases, you might want to make sure that you're actually gaining performance from PMAP, because there are times when I put it in and, just, and benchmarked it and saw that, I, that it just cost time. However, when we insert PMAP here over the calc function, which is a computationally intensive uh, function, we do get a bit of a gain. It's, it's only five nanoseconds, more or less. So it's about 20% gain, but it's still a gain that we get uh, for performance. Uh, do note that we PMAPed the, uh, we PMAPed the more calc uh, computationally intensive part of this entire function here. We didn't PMAP over the VARs because doing that would actually end up costing us a, a fair bit of time. Since VARS is going to be a small collection, and there's no need to parallelize what we're already parallelizing in here. And just because and because it's a small collection, because we're not, like, not much is happening here, we're actually going to lose out, um, lose out there. So it turns out to be a lot faster that way. Uh, and it may differ based off of your scenario, but this is just the example that, that I want to show today. OK. Let's move on into reducers, uh, which is more parallelization, and should be it should be good. What are reducers? So a lot of you might have actually heard of transducers uh, since it's the new and upcoming thing, and 
if, if you have, you can think of them as parallelized transducers. However, there's a lot of you who might not be aware of it. So let's, let's bring it back and start, uh, ha start talking about what we were looking at when we were looking at PMAP. Uh, and while we were looking at PMAP, we, you might have kind of wondered, wouldn't it be great if I, could, if I could have like a parallel reduce? And that's essentially what reducers offer you. I mean, they offer you a lot more. Um, under core reducer, which isn't part of Closure Core, you would have to require it explicitly uh, in your namespace. Under core reducer, you can get parallelization for a lot of common functions, uh, such as map, filter, map, cat, flatten, uh, and a bunch of other ones. Um, the only caveat there is a couple of them aren't, uh, don't actually support parallelization. Uh, I, some of those are at the bottom. I think there's a couple of other ones, uh, but they include functions like take, take while, drop, and so on. So uh, imagine a scenario where you, you want to apply a map over a filter. And wouldn't it be great if you could do these sequentially but also in parallel, like use the full potential of your processor. Uh, I mean, reduce your collection, well, reduce through your collection only once and do it all at the same time. And that's essentially the power that we're looking at here. Reducers, I think, are, are very good for performance. Um, how do you actually use them, though? Um, uh, well, let me get back to that because I just saw a question pop up. Is there a way to control how many threads are working on a PMAP task? Whoops. Sorry. How many threads are working on a PMAP task? Uh, not that I'm aware of. If you want, you could you could like hack together your own PMAP uh, function because uh, it, in there you uh, there's a, the way PMAP works is that it kind of determines how many threads it should be using, I think. Or, or how many calculations it should be doing at the same time. So you could probably hack together your own PMAP task, but not that I'm aware of uh, natively. Uh, yeah. OK, so how do you, how do you use uh, reducers? Uh, so first, you need to reference the namespace, as I just mentioned. Uh, I'm going to be aliasing the namespace as R for the rest of this talk, so you know what I'm looking at. Um, so, so to create a reducer, you would take any of the, any of the following that I list here, and probably a couple others, because I don't think this is an exhaustive list. There's map, map cat, filter, and so on. And then you would apply a reduction using any of the following functions. So you could use uh, reduce fold fold cat, all part of the reducers library, or just or just a regular reduce. Or even if you don't want to reduce it in any in any specific sense, if you don't want to have a reducing function you could just use into and return it as a collection. So for example, you could use into and then put a vector, and it will output uh, your reduction into a, into a vector. So before I move on, and this is something that I haven't even pointed out, what's fold? If you haven't heard of fold, it's kind of a parallelized, reduced, combined form of reduce. So it's used in, the, in, in a very similar fashion to reducers. Um, so R fold, and then you put in a reducing function and a reducer. So there's a couple of caveats here um, that affect uh, a, a couple of caveats that um, that help fold become uh, more computationally. Um, actually, how to put it? That make fold more effective performance-wise, but. Uh, restricted in some sense. So the reducing function that you pass through, it has to be associative. Uh, so it can't be, it can't just be a simple sequence. Uh, yep. Uh, reducing fun uh, function, so, sorry, <laughs> not sequence. It, it just it has to be associative. Um, and reducing function should be a monoid, uh, or it must be a monoid. So this means that it, it, given its identity, even when you pass through zero arguments to reducing function, it should return its identity. Um, so fold helps do all this by chunking your collection into smaller parts, kind of like PMAP, and then reducing and combining them back all together while maintaining order. I mean, again, kind of like PMAP, except it does so using a reducing function. So it's like reduce, but on steroids. Uh, so when do you want to use reducers? So you should be using them if you want parallelism for common functions like map or filter, um, fold, 
uh, fold cat and a lot of things like that. Um, or if you just have a large amount of data and you want to apply computations to it, um, that's where fold comes into comes into use a lot. Or if you just simply want a parallel parallel reduce. However, if you don't really care for parallelism or and just wanted composed functions that go through a go through a collection of items only once, then you might want to look at transducers. Um, uh, link there in the in the presentation. The, you also probably don't want to use this again if you don't want to max out the CPU. Um, someone linked in the chat uh, uh, Claypool. I haven't actually taken a look at Claypool, but I think that uh, I, I've heard of it, and I wonder if that if, if that would help solve the problem for reducers as well as PMAP, uh, the ability to control the number of threads that you're running. Um, so. That that's actually that would be a great solution uh, for both of these cases if it works. I'm not I'm not familiar. Um, so let's go through a, a, a problem again. So in this scenario, we wanted to map through a, a large collection of maps, and select a single value from each map, and then from that result sequence, we would sum up all of those values. So because the collection was like so sizable, we thought that would be a good way to use fold um, and to partition and reduce everything and do it all in parallel. In the end, hope, hopefully saving us time. So the function that we had before, a very simple function, it's just we're trying to get the weighted total of something. So we, ha we have the data collection, and we have a, a weight variable. Uh, so th this weight variable is going to be a keyword. Data is going to be a collection of maps. We're going to map through and get the value of that keyword for each entry and just reduce it with the simple addition function. Um, so that, that's all there is to it. And this, this using criteria uh, gives us like 136 uh, microseconds uh, execution time. However, when we add fold and map, or the reducer fold and reduced map, we we are almost five times faster. We get it down to 29 microseconds. So that's a huge gain uh, because it's doing this all in parallel. And I mean, your mileage may vary again based off of the size of your collection, the function that you're doing. But in this scenario specifically, it helped, redu it helped reduce a very common function that you're we calling a lot of, a lot of cases uh, by almost fivefold. So again, uh, this is. Uh, a scenario where reducers can be very use, useful for are, are situations like uh, like this where you have large uh, collections. Okay, so I'm going to get into some closing thoughts and I'll open it up for questions shortly. Um, so after you're doing all this, I think you should just stop and, and take a minute and realize like, what have I done here? What have I really optimized? Um, and when you do this, you want to ask yourself the question of, does the business value that you create from, from doing any additional optimization after that, which you've already done, outweigh the investment? So if no, you should probably stop. If yes, you might want to continue. But I want to talk about a bit of a trade-off that comes with optimization. Um, with optimization, you, you in some situations give up the readability and simplicity of your code. I mean, a lot of the things I talked about today, I tried to focus on things that would make your code still as readable, as simple as possible. But once you really start digging down into, into optimization, you, you come to realize that the, your code becomes less, uh, less maintainable than before. And there is a cost to that. But if the benefit outweighs that cost, then you should continue. So another thing uh, I wanted to, to talk about today, um, what what area or how do you find areas to optimize? Like how do you find the bottlenecks in your program? And oftentimes it's hard to do. Like if you're just looking at it in a screen, I'm, I'm going to talk about some common areas here that you can look at. But of like very useful tools are uh, are Java profilers that would help you determine like what calls are being made repetitively, uh, where your comp where your CPU is most being used, um, and so on. But if you don't have any of that, or if you're just kind of like trying to figure out what's um, trying to figure out like what's going on, uh, what parts could be more optimal, and so on, 
you could often you, you could just look for like uh, re repetitive maps or filters like sequentially being used. I mean, there you could even use transducers instead of uh, reducers. Um, or if if you know that some calculations that are going to be like computationally expensive, but are, you're calling them again and again, you could potentially memoize them if that if that's reasonable in that scenario. So I mean, that's just a couple of ideas for for what to look for when you want to optimize. Um, yeah. So. Uh, so quick summary of like what I talked about today. Benchmarking everything is important. You need to make sure that the change you're making actually actually helps improve performance. Um, as Anders points out in the chat, you also probably want to make sure that your optimized function does the same thing as your non-optimized function. So tests help with that so much. Um, sometimes you you think you might be optimizing something, but you could actually be losing time. So you gotta you gotta keep measuring and make sure that what you're actually doing helps, uh, and you should also only optimize when it's reasonable to do so. I, I mean, unless you just want to do it for like the sake of learning, or you're really interested in, uh, in optimization for a hobby project or something like that. But there are very much trade-offs to optimization, uh, whether it be in your time, whether it be in uh, you gain like one percent for for a week of work, or or it be in the sense that your code becomes less maintainable, less readable. And I mean, if you're very like if performance is very critical to you, you might want to consider looking at native level code. So you might want to consider like going to C for some stuff because real because honestly, it's uh, it's quite difficult to to make closure as fast as native level uh, native native level code. Um, so at least for the computationally intensive stuff. Um, anyways, that's pretty much it. Uh, happy hunting for for optimization and for efficiencies. So thanks, guys. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Um, I'll, I'll take a quick look in the chat while you go ahead. Uh, if you can keep. Yes. Uh, OK, so I, you mentioned Java profilers. Can you recommend any besides Visual VM? Oh, um, I, I, there's actually two that, uh, there's two that I like. Uh, I haven't actually used Visual VM, to be honest. Uh, there's two that I like, but unfortunately, both cost money. Uh, there's JProfiler, which uh, I'm currently using. And there's another one that uh, there's another one that I need to Google because I forgot the name. Um, but it's like it's the first one that you, yeah, it's uh, the YourKit Java Profiler. That one I used for a while, but I wasn't actually a huge fan of uh, of it, I, for some reason, J Profiler just like made more sense to me when I was using it. Both both are good though. I recommend both. Very interesting on thoughts and optimizations in closure script land. Oh, <laughs> I'm not actually familiar with the optimizing in closure script. Um, I know there's uh, I know there's always discussion on how how. It, it's difficult to, to optimize uh, because it's only in one thread or something along those lines. But I'm not too familiar with Closure Script and the front end. So I, I, I feel like I shouldn't comment uh, too much there. Um, OK, so you mentioned that you want PMAP in the inner loop and the outer loop. Oh, sorry, you meant, the question is, you mentioned that you want the PMAP in the inner loop rather than the outer loop when the outer loop has a small number of items. Can I re-explain why that's the case? Um, so in the scenario, so this is a uh, again your mileage may vary. Uh, in the scenario that I was looking at, the inner inner loop had a very computationally intensive function that would take a long amount of time, as well as was mapping through a large number of items. Um, that in itself allowed PMAP to split up the collection into a bunch of different chunks and then run them in parallel and then synchronize them all back together. Uh, so the, while PMAP had gains in running everything in parallel and kind of splitting it up, um, it it kind of, it lost some some of that time while it was trying to synchronize and merge things back together. Um, for the outer loop, it would it would only be uh, it would be splitting up a very small collection, at least in the scenario I was looking at, uh, where it was like maybe at most thirty items. Uh, and there's really not much to be gained uh, gained from splitting something that small up and then trying to merge it back together. 
uh, when we ran it through Criterium, uh, I think it, it tripled or quadrupled uh, our original benchmark time by adding a PMAP in that loop. So it really just wasn't uh, worthwhile. Um, okay. Would you mind explaining the difference in different use cases between reducers and transducers again? Uh, sure. So, so for, uh, first, let's uh, let's I'll, I'll quickly talk about transducers uh, since we didn't really focus on them too much in this talk. So, um, trend. So, both of them let you kind of go through a collection only once instead of instead of doing it multiple times. So, let's say you have a map and you have a filter. Uh, it's as if you're mapping and filtering through the collection only once rather than going through it multiple times. Uh, and that's kind of what transducers and reducers let you do. Um, the only difference is that transducers uh, do it, do it um, not in parallel. So reducers just let you, let you do it in parallel. Um, there's not, uh, I mean, there's also a bit of a difference in, in how you would create them and whatnot, but in, Simple terms, the difference is that reducers let, let you do what transducers do in parallel. Um, Anders, in my opinion, it's about getting, yeah, yeah, that, essentially what Anders was saying uh, would agree with that. OK. OK, uh, any other questions? If not, I think we're done here. Uh, thanks, everyone. I hope, uh, I hope you found this talk useful. and. Uh, and good luck in your optimization. Uh, have a great rest of the conference. Take care.